the attack at Frommel, Battle of Frommel, Battle of Fleur Bay or Schlacht von Frommel, 19 the 20th of July 1916, was a military operation on the Western Front during the First World War. The attack was carried out by British and Australian troops and was subsidiary to the Battle of the Somme. General headquarters of the British Expeditionary Force had ordered the 1st Army and 2nd Army to prepare attacks to support the 4th Army on the Somme, 50 miles to the south, to exploit any weakening of the German defences opposite. The attack took place 9.9 miles from Lille, between the Fourquisard Trivert Road and Cordonry Farm, an area overlooked from Ober's Ridge to the south. The ground was low-lying and much of the defensive fortification by both sides consisted of building breastworks, rather than trenches. The operation was conducted by 11 Corps of the 1st Army with the 61st Division and the 5th Australian Division, Australian Imperial Force against the 6th Bavarian Reserve Division, supported by the two flanking divisions of the German 6th Army. Preparations for the attack were rushed, the troops involved lacked experience in trench warfare and the power of the German defence was significantly underestimated, the attackers being outnumbered two to one. The advance took place in daylight, on a narrow front, against defences overlooked by Ober's Ridge, with German artillery on either side free to fire into the flanks of the attack. Another attack by the 61st Division early on 20 July was cancelled, after it was realised that German counter-attacks had already forced a retirement by the Australian troops to the original front line. On 19 July, General Erich von Falkenhayn, head of Oberste Heresleitung judged Trommel to be the offensive he expected against the 6th Army. The attack gained no ground but inflicted some casualties, next day the failure was evident and a captured operation order from 11 Corps revealed the limited nature of the operation. In 2012, a study of German records showed that no German division opposite 11 Corps moved until four to nine weeks later, Falkenhayn sent divisions from the Suchet Vimy area, 20 miles south instead, which had been misinterpreted in earlier accounts. The attack was the debut of the AFE on the Western Front and the Australian War Memorial described it as the worst 24 hours in Australia's entire history. Of 7,080 BIF casualties, 5,533 were suffered by the 5th Australian Division, the Germans suffered 1,600 to 2,000 casualties and lost 150 prisoners. Chapter 1 – Background On 5 July, during the Battle of the Somme GHQ informed the three other British Army commanders that the German defences on the Somme might soon fall. The 1st and 2nd Army commanders were required to choose places to penetrate the German defences, if the attacks on the Somme continued to make progress. Gaps were to be widened to exploit weakness, and disorganisation of the German defence. The second army commander, General Herbert Plumer was occupied by preparations for an offensive at Mazines Ridge but could spare a division for a joint attack with the first army at the army boundary. On 8 July, General Charles Monroe ordered the 11th Corps commander, Lieutenant General Richard Haking, to plan a two-division attack. Haking proposed to capture Ober's Ridge, Ober's and Frommel but the next day Monroe dropped Ober's Ridge from the attack as he and Plumer thought that no great objective could be achieved with the troops available. On 13 July, after receiving intelligence reports that the Germans had transferred about nine infantry battalions from the Lille area from 9 to 12 July, GHQ informed the two army commanders that a joint attack was to be carried out around 18 July, to exploit the depletion of the German defenders. Haking was ordered to begin a big preliminary bombardment to simulate a large offensive and conduct a local infantry attack on the German front line. On 16 July, discussions about the attack resumed, as the need for diversions to coincide with operations on the Somme had diminished when the Germans had not collapsed after the British success at the Battle of Bosanton Ridge. Sir Douglas Haig, Commander-in-Chief of the BIF, did not want the attack unless it could succeed and Monroe and Haking opposed a postponement or cancellation. The weather had been dull on 15 July and next day, soon after Monroe and Haking made the decision to go ahead, it began to rain. Zero hour for the main bombardment was postponed because of the weather and at 8.30 am, 
Haking delayed the attack for at least 24 hours, after having second thoughts, Monroe postponed the operation until 19 July. Chapter 2, Prelude Chapter 2 Section 1, Offensive Preparations The Second Army provided the 5th Australian Division, the artillery of the 4th Australian Division and heavy guns and trench mortars to 11 Corps, for an attack from the Forquies of Trivet Road to La Boutillerie, with the 31st Division and 61st Division. Lack of artillery, training and experience in the Australian Divisional Artilleries and some of the heavy batteries, led to the attack front being reduced to 4,000 yards between the Forquies at Trivet Road and Delinga Farm. The ground was waterlogged, flat and visible from Ober's Ridge, behind the German front to the south. The 39th Division and 31st Division moved their boundaries north as the 61st Division concentrated along the Four Quays at Trivolet Road to Bond Street. The 20th Division moved its boundary south to Cordon Ree Farm on the left of the 5th Australian Division, which concentrated from Bond Street to Cordon Ree Farm. The 12 attacking battalions were supported by more artillery than the Battle of Obers Ridge in May 1915, more ammunition was available and there were trench mortars for wire cutting. With support from 1st Army artillery to the south, 296 field guns and 78 heavy guns were ready, which gave a greater concentration of heavy artillery than that of the 4th Army on the first day of the Somme. After several postponements for rain, visibility was better on the 18th of July and the artillery bombardment proceeded. The shelling of the German front at La Bessay was repeated, and the German artillery retaliated. Chapter 2 Section 2 Plan The German salient at Frommel contained some higher ground facing northwest, known as the Sugarloaf. The small size and height of the salient gave the Germans observation of no man's land on either flank. The 5th Australian Division was to attack the left flank of the salient by advancing south as the 61st Division attacked on the right flank from the west. Each division was to attack with three brigades in line, with two battalions from each brigade in the attack and the other two in reserve, ready to take over captured ground or to advance further. Haking issued the attack orders on 14 July, when wire cutting began along the 11th Corps front. It was intended that the bombardment would inflict mass casualties on the German infantry, reducing them to a state of collapse. The British infantry were to assemble as close to the German lines as possible, no man's land being 100 to 400 yards wide, before the British artillery fire was lifted from the front line, the infantry would rush the surviving Germans while they were disorganized and advance to the German second line. Heavy artillery began registration and a slow bombardment on 16 July and two days of bombardment began either side of La Bessay Canal as a diversion. The main bombardment was to begin at midnight on 17-18 July for seven hours. Over the final three hours, the artillery was to lift and the infantry show bayonets and dummy figures several times, to simulate an infantry advance, then the artillery was to resume bombardment of the front line to catch the German infantry out of cover. Chapter 2 Section 3 – German Preparations General Erich von Falkenhayn the German chief of the general staff, had ordered a construction program on the Western Front in January 1915, to make it capable of being defended indefinitely by a small force against superior numbers. An elaborate, carefully sited and fortified front position was built behind fields of barbed wire, with camouflaged concrete machine gun nests and a second trench close behind the front trench, to shelter the trench garrison during bombardments. Communication trenches were built to evade Allied artillery fire intended to obstruct the movement of reinforcements from the new rear defences. The front position was to be held at all costs as the main line of resistance but in May 1915, Falkenhayn ordered a reserve position to be built along the Western Front, 2,000 to 3,000 yards behind the front position, out of range of enemy field artillery. To contain a breakthrough, the second position was to be occupied opposite a sector broken into and serve as a jumping-off point for counter-attacks. If the front line could not be recovered, the rear position could be connected to the remaining parts of the front line on either side to contain the break-in. The construction program, 
was a huge undertaking and was completed in the autumn 1915. The fortification program had several opponents, notably the 6th Army Commander Crown Prince Ruprecht, who claimed that a rear position would undermine the determination of soldiers to stand their ground. The front of the 6th Army had been quiet since the Battle of Luz and in July 1916, the 6th Bavarian Reserve Division held a 4.5 miles stretch of the front with four regiments, from east of Ober's village, north to a point near Boys Grenna, each regiment having one battalion in the front line, one in support and one in reserve. On one regimental front there were 75 shelters with 9 to 12 in of concrete protection. After a British gas attack opposite Nerve Chapelle and Fort Cuisset late on 15 July, German artillery bombarded the British front line and a raid on the Australian lines by 100 troops of Bavarian Reserve Infantry Regiment 21, caused nearly 100 casualties, taking three prisoners, for a loss of 32 casualties. Chapter 3 – Attack Chapter 3 Section 1 – First Army Patrols during the night reported no movement in the German lines, which appeared to be weakly held. German covering parties stopped Australian raiders on the right flank of the 5th Australian Division front, where the wire appeared to be intact except on the left. It was hazy early on the 19th of July but the artillery zero hour was fixed for 11 a.m., ready for the attack at 6 p.m. A special heavy artillery bombardment began on the Shabilo for 2.35 p.m., by which time a German counter-bombardment was falling all along the attack front, causing casualties to the Australians and the field gunners of the 61st Division at Rue Tilloloy. Several ammunition dumps were exploded and the decoy lifts by the British artillery failed to deceive the Germans. The Australian and British infantry began to move into no man's land at 530p.m. In the 61st Division area, infantry of the 182nd Brigade on the right flank, began to move into no man's land through sally ports but some were under German machine gun fire and became death traps. Two companies of the right hand battalion managed to get within 50 yards of the German parapet, with few casualties, then rushed the breastwork as the artillery lifted, finding the wire cut and the Germans incapable of resistance. Uncut wire held up the advance to the second line and German machine gun fire from the right flank caused many casualties as the survivors reached the objective. Reinforcements reached the front trench but German flanking fire caused many casualties and German artillery began to bombard the captured area. The left-hand battalion lost more men in no man's land and then found that the wire at the wick salient was uncut. The few infantry to get through the wire were shot down short of the front trench, reinforcements were also caught in no man's land and pinned down. In the center, the 183rd Brigade was bombarded before the advance began and shrapnel shell fire prevented the infantry from using the sally ports. After climbing the parapet, both battalions were shot down in no man's land, only a few men getting close to the German wire before being killed or wounded. On the left, the attacking battalions of the 184th Brigade had been in the front line under German artillery fire all morning. On the right, the sally ports were under fire and only a few troops reached the German wire, finding that his was uncut, before falling back. The attack of the left-hand battalion towards the Sugarloaf salient was stopped by German fire on the sally ports, the British tried to exit along Ron the Sap, which was under shrapnel bombardment. Most of the battalion was destroyed but some troops reached the northeast part of the salient, and tried to enter the German breastwork, until all became casualties. On the 5th Australian Division front, the troops attacked over the parapet, suffering fewer casualties than the 61st Division. The 15th Brigade advanced next to the British 183rd Brigade towards the junction of the German line and Lays Brook which ran diagonally across no man's land. The right battalion advance was stopped by machine gun fire from the Sugarloaf after 300 yards and the left-hand battalion ran into uncut wire, both battalions suffering many casualties as the survivors dug in. In the Australian centre the 14th Brigade had fewer casualties, reached the German front line and took a number of prisoners. When the Australians pressed on they found only flat fields and ditches full of water. 
A line was selected for consolidation, and ten machine guns were sent forward. The 8th Australian Brigade battalions attacked through machine gun fire from the front and flanks. A 1,200 pounds mine was blown on the outer flank to make a crater lip to screen the attacking infantry but when the Australians reached the German breastwork they kept going, finding the same terrain as the 14th Australian Brigade. The 32nd Australian Battalion, on the eastern flank, suffered many casualties while attacking a German stronghold in the ruins of Dellinger Farm and elements of the 14th Australian Brigade reached a main road 437 yards south of the German line before withdrawing to the ditch. The 8th and 14th Australian Brigades had gained their objectives, capturing about 1,094 yards of the German front line. A line was selected for consolidation and at a strong point built at the end of the Caissonweg, a German communication trench. Reinforcements with equipment and tools went forward and work began on a communication trench across no man's land in the midst of a German artillery barrage and movement attracting machine gun fire. By 7 p.m. accurate reports reached Major General Colin Mackenzie, commander of the 61st Division, of the success on the right, along with erroneous reports of limited success in the centre and a small lodgment on the Sugarloaf on the left. At 7.30 p.m., Haking ordered Mackenzie to attack the Sugarloaf again to assist the Australians, before it was discovered that the 184th Brigade had been held up short of its objective. The 15th Australian Brigade was asked to cooperate with the British attack and the 58th Australian Battalion was sent forward. A renewed bombardment continued as preparations were made to attack all along the front at 9 p.m., when at 8.20 p.m., Haking cancelled the attack and ordered that all troops were to be withdrawn after dark. Reinforcements for the 182nd Brigade received the order in time but the troops in the German line were overwhelmed, only a few wounded and stragglers getting away. Troops pinned down in no man's land withdrew under cover of the bombardment and parties went out to rescue wounded. More discussion between Mackenzie and Haking, led to the Corps commander ordering the 184th Brigade to attack the Sugarloaf overnight, after a 10-minute hurricane bombardment, German shelling on the British front line then caused a postponement until the morning. The postponement failed to reach the 58th Australian Battalion, which attacked with some of the 59th Australian Battalion, and was stopped in no man's land with many casualties, survivors from three battalions finding their way back after dark. Despite reinforcements, the situation of the 14th Australian Brigade in the German lines became desperate. Artillery fire and German counterattacks from the open right flank forced a slow withdrawal in the dark. On the left flank, more troops were sent forward, with ammunition, to the 8th Australian Brigade at dusk and at 2 a.m. every soldier who could be found was sent forward. Consolidation in the German lines was slow as the troops lacked experience, many officers had become casualties and there was no dry soil to fill sandbags, mud being a poor substitute. German counterattacks on the front and flanks, with machine gun fire from Dellinger Farm, de Moquet Farm, and the Tadpole, began at 3.15 am on 20 July, forcing a retirement to the German first line and then a withdrawal to the original front line, Many Australians were cut off and captured. News of the retirement by the 8th Australian Brigade reached Mackay while at a meeting with Mackenzie, Haking, and Monroe, to plan the new attack by the 61st Division. Monroe ordered the 14th Australian Brigade to be withdrawn and at 5.40 am the artillery began a box barrage around the brigade. At 7.50 am the order to retire arrived, although it was not received by some parties. German troops had got well behind the right flank and fired at every sign of movement, forcing the Australians to withdraw along the communication trench dug overnight. By 9 a.m. the remnants of the 53rd, 54th and 55th Australian battalions had returned, many wounded were rescued but only four of the machine guns were recovered. Artillery fire by both sides diminished and work began on either side of no man's land to repair defences, a short truce was negotiated by the Germans and Australians to recover their wounded. Chapter 3 Section 2 – Air Operations From 14 July the Illies Bekamps Road, three miles behind the German front line, 
was kept under air observation by the Royal Flying Corps. On 16 July 16 Squadron joined 10 Squadron on the attack front along with a kite balloon section, bringing the I Brigade RFC squadrons supporting the attack up to three Corps squadrons and two Army squadrons. The Corps aircraft photographed and reconnoitred the area before the attack and flew artillery observation and contact patrols during the battle. Army squadrons flew further afield and denied German reconnaissance aircraft view of British troop movements, particularly behind the 11th Corps front. On 19 July, aircraft from two squadrons patrolled the area towards Lille and had numerous air engagements, in which two Fokker E is and a British DH.2 were shot down. Bombing raids on German army billets, supply dumps and the railways from Lille to Lens, Douai, Cambrai and Valenciennes also took place. Chapter 3 Section 3, German 6th Army Opposite the British right, Bavarian Reserve Regiment 17 lost a switch trench facing Trivlet, a second line was overrun and the garrison was lost. Troops on the left of 3 Battalion to the south of the Trivlet Road bombed to its right and part of I Battalion attacked frontally and from the right, taking 61 prisoners. On the Australian flank, 3 Battalion, Bavarian Reserve Regiment, 21 was pushed back in the centre and on its right, forming a defensive flank at the Caissonweg and in front of Dellinger Farm. The right flank of 3 Battalion, Bavarian Reserve Regiment 16 repulsed the 15th Australian Brigade and was then reinforced by the 2nd Battalion from Rue Delaval, which joined with the left of 3 Battalion, Bavarian Reserve Regiment 21. A counter-attack ordered by the divisional commander at 8 p.m., fell into confusion in the dark, under British artillery fire and an attack on the 8th Australian Brigade, by part of I Battalion, Bavarian Reserve Regiment 21 was stopped by Australian small arms fire. Later on, two other companies attacked up the Caissonweg as I Battalion, Bavarian Reserve Regiment 21 and half of Bavarian Reserve Regiment 20 attacked from the flank, reaching the old front line at 6 a.m. on 20 July. The right flank of the 14th Australian Brigade was counter-attacked by most of I Battalion, Bavarian Reserve Regiment 16, which joined the 2nd Battalion and recaptured the front line step by step until dawn, when a pause was ordered due to exhaustion and lack of ammunition and grenades. When the attack resumed, the troops met those of Bavarian Reserve Regiment 21 at around 8.10 am German artillery support was less extensive than that available to the attackers but managed to smother the British trenches with fire as the artillery of the 50th Reserve Division and 54th Reserve Division fired from the flanks thus the backbone of the British attack was broken before it left the trenches at 5.30 pm. Chapter 4, Aftermath Chapter 4 Section 1, Analysis Neither division was well prepared for the attack, the 61st Division had disembarked in France in late May 1916, after delays in training caused by equipment shortages and being milked for drafts to the 48th Division. The British entered the front line for the first time on 13 June and every man not due to participate, in the attack spent from 16 to 19 July removing poison gas cylinders from the front line after the discharge planned for the 15th of July was suspended due to the wind falling, 470 cylinders were removed before the work was stopped because the men were exhausted. The 5th Australian Division had arrived in France only days before the attack and had relieved the 4th Australian Division on the right flank of the 2nd Army by the 12th of July. The Australian Divisional Artillery and some of the heavy artillery had no experience of Western Front conditions and as Ianzac Corps prepared to move south to the Somme Front, a considerable shuffling of divisions had taken place, which hampered preparations for the attack. The limited nature of the attack quickly became obvious to the German commanders. A German report on 30 July, recorded that captured officers, said that the Australians made a fundamental mistake in trying to hold the German Second Trench rather than falling back to the front trench and consolidating. When the 15th Australian Brigade was pinned down in no man's land, the continuity of the attack broke down and lost protection against flanking fire from the right, which enabled German troops to counter-attack, regain the first trench and cut off the Australian troops further forward. A German assessment of the 16th of December, 
called the attack operationally and tactically senseless and that prisoner interrogations revealed that the Australian troops were physically imposing but had virtually no military discipline, and no interest in soldiering as it was understood in Europe. A communique, released to the press by British GHQ, was not favourably received by the Australians. Yesterday evening, south of Armentieres, we carried out some important raids on a front of two miles in which Australian troops took part. About 140 German prisoners were captured. Australian casualties and doubts about the judgment of higher commanders, damaged relations between the AFE and the British, with doubts about the reliability of British troops, spreading in Australian units. In 2008, Geoffrey Gray wrote that McKay also made errors in judgment that contributed to the result, citing McKay's order not to consolidate the initial gains and that poor planning, ineffective artillery support and Australian inexperience of Western Front conditions, contributed to the failure. A number of senior Australian officers were removed after the debacle, and the recuperation of the 5th Australian Division took until late summer, when it began trench raiding. In October, the 6th Bavarian Reserve Division, with morale high after the defensive success at Frommel, was sent to the Somme front and never recovered from the ordeal. Bavarian Reserve Regiment 16 spent 10 days in the line and suffered 1,177 casualties. In 2012, Michael Sr. wrote that the objective of the attack was contained in the 1st Army Operational Order 100. To prevent the enemy from moving troops southwards, to take part in the main battle. Haking had ordered that the troops due to attack were to be told that. The commander-in-chief had directed 11 corps to attack the enemy in front of us, capture his front-line system of trenches, and thus prevent him from reinforcing his troops to the south. Senior wrote that historians generally judged the attack to have failed in its objective, to prevent German troops being transferred to the Somme. Wilfred Miles, the British official historian, wrote that the 9th Reserve Corps and the Guard Reserve Corps had been moved to the Somme. In his 2012 biography of Haking, Senior wrote that he had only consulted the Official History Volume 1916 for his earlier book and had changed his mind after studying German records. Peter Pedersen wrote that the Germans knew that Frommel was a decoy and sent reserves to the Somme. In the Australian Official History Charles Bin wrote, that the attack showed the Germans that they were free to withdraw troops. In 2007, Paul Cobb wrote that the Germans were not deterred from sending troops to the Somme. Senior wrote that there was evidence that the transfer of troops to the south was delayed by the attack on Frommel, a German intelligence officer of the 6th Bavarian Reserve Division wrote on 20 the July, there are no signs of any immediate repetition of the enemy attack, however, judging by the general situation, a new push is not impossible. A Bavarian document discovered in 1923 contained information that an order was captured declaring that the object of the attack was to keep German troops engaged in the sector so as to keep pressure from the Somme, a repetition of these attacks is therefore to be expected. Charles Bin wrote in 1930 that the Bavarians might have been skeptical that the British would sacrifice 7,000 men as a decoy. The 9th Reserve Corps and Guard Reserve Corps had been moved from the Souchevimi area, 20 miles from Frommel, well outside the sector opposite the British 11 Corps. Troops kept in the Luz Armentier sector, opposite 11 Corps, for four weeks after the 19th of July were held back as a precaution. German records showed that eight divisions were in the line between Luz and Armentier on the 1st of July and that two were sent to the Somme by the 2nd of July. Long before the Frommel attack, the other six divisions stayed opposite 11 Corps for five to nine weeks after the 19th of July. Had divisions moved earlier, the Battle of Pozier might have cost Ianzac Corps far more than the 23,000 casualties that it suffered. Senior concluded that because of the attack at Frommel, German troops had been retained opposite 11 Corps as intended. Chapter 4 Section 2 Casualties the battle caused one of the greatest numbers of Australian deaths in action in 24 hours, surpassed only at the Battle of Bullcourt in 1917. The 5th Australian Division suffered 5,513 casualties, 2,000 men in the 8th Australian Brigade, 
1,776 men of the 15th Australian Brigade, 1,717 men in the 14th Australian Brigade and 88 men from the Divisional Engineers. Two battalions had so many casualties that they had to be rebuilt. Of 887 personnel from the 60th Australian Battalion, only one officer and 106 other ranks survived unwounded, and the 32nd Australian Battalion suffered 718 casualties. The 31st Australian Battalion had 544 casualties and the 32nd Australian Battalion lost 718 men killed and wounded. The 61st Division was under strength before the battle and contributed only half as many men as the 5th Australian Division and suffered 1,547 casualties. The 6th Bavarian Reserve Division suffered casualties of 1,600 to 2,000 men. Australian and British soldiers killed in the area that was retaken by the Germans, were buried shortly after the battle. The burial pits were photographed from a British reconnaissance aircraft on 21 July but marked as dugouts or trench mortar positions. On the 22nd of July, the bodies were taken by narrow-gauge trench railway and buried in 810 by 2.2 by 5 metres pits. Chapter 5, Commemoration Chapter 5 Section 1, New Cemetery most war graves on the Western Front were discovered by official surveys during the 1920s, British and Empire dead were reburied in Imperial War Graves Commission cemeteries. 400 unidentified Australian soldiers killed in the attack at Fromel were reburied at the VC Corner Australian Cemetery and Memorial, two kilometres northwest of Fromel. Mortal remains of those killed in no man's land were recovered after the war and buried at VC Corner British Cemetery. In 2002, Lambis Engelsos was inspired by Don't Forget Me Cobber, to search for an unmarked mass grave near Fromel. The site was found by Engelsos and other researchers near Fromel at Le Bois au Fond du Village, Fan and Valken to the Germans. The researchers believed that the pits had not been found after the war and gained support for an exploration of the site from the Australian Army, and the British All-Party Parliamentary War Graves and Battlefield Heritage Group. In 2007, a geophysical survey was commissioned by the Australian government. The survey indicated that the pits had been undisturbed since the war and contained the remains of 337 soldiers. From 23 May to 13 June 2008, an exploratory dig found human remains, personal effects, webbing, brass fitments, uniform badges, buttons and British .303 ammunition in five of six pits, which were then refilled. Exhumations took place from May to September 2009, which recovered the mortal remains of 250 soldiers, approximately 173 being Australian, from whom DNA samples were taken. The original burial site was unsuitable and a new CWGC War Cemetery was built about 130 yards away. On 30 January 2010, the first body was interred at Fromel Military Cemetery, and the remaining bodies were buried in individual ceremonies by the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers and the Australian Army. In March 2010, it was reported that 75 Australian soldiers killed at Fromel had been identified from DNA. On 19 July 2010, the 94th anniversary of the battle, the last soldier was buried. The cemetery was dedicated in a broadcast public ceremony. Chapter 5 Section 2 – Memorials and Museum There are several memorials in the Fromel area commemorating the battle. The VC Corner Australian Cemetery and Memorial was built in the early 1920s, the Australian Memorial Park opened in 1998 and the Fromel Military Cemetery was completed in 2010. There are other small cemeteries in the area with burials from the battle. In Fromel Town Hall, there is a museum run by the Association pour le Souvenir de la Bataille de Fromel. A new Musée de la Bataille de Fromel is under construction. The plaque it pays tribute to the pioneering work of Robin Caulfield and Lambis Engelsos in gaining wider attention to the battle, and the loss of life of so many Australians, as well as British soldiers. 
The museum opened 2014 to coincide with the unveiling of some new headstones in the cemetery to mark other soldiers whose remains have been identified. Chapter 5 Section 3, 2016 Memorial Event Controversy In 2016, plans to hold a memorial event at the Pheasantwood Military Cemetery were announced with the controversial decision to exclude British attendees from the ceremony. The move provoked anger amongst some families of the approximately 1,500 British casualties. Families feel totally insulted by the attitude of the Australian authorities. Men from both countries fought together and died together but now the Australians want to airbrush the British out of the battle. The Australian Department of Veterans Affairs said that a decision has been made by the Australian government to favour the Australians and French. This is not to diminish the role of other nations but simply a recognition of the Australian focus of the event we are organising.